Welcome to the inaugural episode of Sad Boys Ringside. My name is Dusty, and today we'll be covering the WWE Premium Live Event, as they call it. Um, I'll probably still be calling them pay-per-views because that's how I grew up. Uh, Money in the Bank 2023. It aired Saturday, July 1st, 2023. And let's talk about it. So, this is the sixth main brand WWE pay-per-view for this year. Uh, so far, we've had the Royal Rumble, Elimination Chamber, WrestleMania, Backlash, and Night of Champions, and now we've had Money in the Bank. So, they started off the night with the men's Money in the Bank match, which I'm all for that. Uh, Money in the Bank is one of my favorite pay-per-views, personally. Uh, I would say probably that and SummerSlam tend to be my favorites, at least, at least traditionally. Uh, obviously quality kind of changes year to year depending on the storylines and just the general quality of the writing which you know that's a whole thing in and of itself but but when I was a kid SummerSlam was like the big one for me so anyways starting off with the men's money in the bank we had Butch who I'm probably gonna if I call him Pete Dunn forgive me I know him as Pete Dunn because I've been watching him as Pete Dunn ever since he was in the indie circuit as far back as like 2017 or 2018. So I think this whole Butch name change that happened sometime in the last year is really stupid. So forgive me if I still call him Pete Dunn because that's how I've known him for like six or seven years now. Uh, LA Knight, Logan Paul, Ricochet, Santos Escobar, Shinsuke Nakamura, and Damian Priest. Uh, just to give some really quick thoughts about each of these wrestlers and my thoughts on them i'll try and keep this really brief um just start with pete dunn like i said i i watched him a little bit if anyone remembers uh what culture professional wrestling ooh, that's that's uh one of the one of the ways i was introduced to him uh that's a real throwback i think they had a name change i i, I stopped watching by the time they they had a name change and they went out of business and that's a whole ordeal but Oh man, if anybody ever watched uh, What Culture Professional Wrestling, if anyone remembers What Culture to begin with, um, shout out to that. That was a lot of fun. Uh, my man Joe Hendry, I think he's in Ring of Honor now. Joe, Hen Joe Hendry was my favorite in that, but uh, Pete Dunne was good, Will Ospreay was good, uh, Drew McIntyre was in that too, uh, in between his stints in WWE. Uh, anyways, uh, so Pete Dunne's fun. I, I think he's, he's good at what he does. I think he's probably underutilized in WWE, but whatever um la knight i don't really follow him too too heavily uh i can't really have an opinion on him based on his performance tonight i'll get into that in a minute uh ricochet oof i love ricochet i've been a fan of him ever since i first saw him i think he's great i think he's horribly underutilized he's so much fun to watch he's a he's a great he's probably been my my favorite high flyer since rob van dam he's fantastic and i wish that the WWE would push him because he's fantastic. Uh, Santos Escobar, I know he's part of the newly reformed Latino World Order. Um, I haven't really been keeping up too much with them, but uh, didn't hate what I saw. He seemed uh, really fun to watch, but uh, it seems like they kind of have him more as a mid-carder, if anything. So I don't know, but uh, I like what I saw uh, in, in Money in the Bank, so I don't know. Uh, Shinsuke Nakamura... Dude's so much fun. Uh, I always enjoy watching him perform. Dude's like, he's a great technical wrestler. Uh, just really fun to watch. I Not really anything negative I can say about Shinsuke. He's so much fun. He's really great. He's, it seems like he's kind of become a mid-card wrestler in the last five years or so, but it's unfortunate. But, you know, it's it's I guess it's the business. But, yeah, Shinsuke's a lot of fun. Great, great wrestler, and I, I enjoy watching him. Uh, Damian Priest of The Judgment Day. Who, uh, man, uh, the, the Judgment Day, that's kind of a whole thing in and of itself. Uh, I don't hate the Judgment Day, I don't love them either. I, I think it's just, you know, one of those factions, they're kind of the, that middling faction where there's some good people in it, and there's some Dominic Mysterio in it, and it's, I, honestly, I can kind of take them or leave them. I think Damian Priest is very talented, I think he's got some, some nice flair, some nice style to him, so I think he's entertaining. And then Logan Paul, um, it's, it's Logan Paul, man, like, if you, if you know anything about Logan Paul, you probably know any one number of his controversies over the years, I grew up 
I say grew up, I was already an adult by the time he really kind of came into my, uh, my knowledge of the internet zeitgeist, but, uh, dude's a jackass. Uh, credit where it's due, he seems to be a real talent in WWE, but I don't think that excuses how much of a jackass he is, and, you know, all you gotta do is just Google his name and see all the things that he's done that has either pissed people off or made him look like an absolute fool. Um, I don't much care for him personally from everything I've seen over the last 10 plus years of him being internet relevant, but whatever. He was thrown in this match last minute-ish, maybe, I, I don't know, but he didn't qualify, and that's why it was a seven-man, and they made that clear at the start of the match that uh, they weren't, or at least the, the, the kayfabe of it was, they, the, the other six did not much care for it, so I thought it was a fun little start with, um, with everybody just kind of piling in on him. Uh, so going into it, uh, my heart, my heart really wanted Ricochet to win it. He's my favorite uh, of the bunch there. As I said, I, I love Ricochet. Dude's really fun to watch. He just does, he does just crazy shit, and it's, it's always a blast. Dude puts his body on the line in ways that a lot of other people are afraid to do or just won't do, and that's fine. But that added spectacle really just, I mean, it adds, man. It, it it adds, and dude, dude's a real, um, real worker. But yeah, my heart wanted him to win, but my, my, my brain said that it was going to come down to either LA Knight because he's super over right now, uh, Logan Paul because I, I don't know, they seem to be wanting to push him too, so I thought Logan Paul had a chance. Uh, but if I had to put money on it, I would have put money on Damian Priest because there seemed to be a lot kind of building around like the Judgment Day and around him in particular. So my, my thought process going into it was... I feel like it could really go the way of uh, L.A. Knight, Logan Paul, or Damian Priest, but if I had to put my money down, I would have put it down on Damian Priest, and I would have I would have been a happy man at the end of the match because Damian Priest did end up winning. He won in a really great way. I, I do like how the match ended up. I do think that the, uh, the middle bit was kind of weak. I, I thought it was a really good start and a really good end. The middle was a kind of kind of slow, kind of a little boring. Not really a lot was going on. It was you know everybody was kind of broken up, and we were getting the little like vignettes of this person versus this person, this person versus this person, and we had the bit with Logan Paul doing the 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 splash onto Damian Priest on the on the ladder, which it was it was a pretty good spot, all things considered. But uh, something that kind of I, I don't know. I want to say it held this match back from being great. It was a very good match. I had a lot of fun. It was a very fun men's money in the bank match. But I think the thing that kind of kept it from being a great match for me was it really felt like LA Knight, Ricochet, Pete Dunn, Shinsuke, and Santos Escobar were just kind of there. They, they really felt like filler wrestlers that just kind of existed to just take up the slots, which is crazy given how over LA Knight is right now. But he really felt like he, he just didn't really have a presence. The only real presence he had was at the very end when he almost got the case and then Damian Priest came up and did a broken arrow off the top of the ladder and then went up and won. So LA Knight just kind of felt there. Um, the other four, like I said, just kind of felt there. This really did kind of feel like a um, Damian Priest and Logan Paul affair. And that was shown pretty heavily near the beginning with the when they were they, they had their like momentary truce setting up the two tables together, and then Damian Priest immediately turned on Logan Paul. Um, but that did lead to my favorite spot in the entire match with Ricochet and Logan Paul being uh, on the ropes, on the outside of the ropes, and Ricochet just doing, oh my god, I think it was a shooting star? I, or no, a Spanish fly. I think it was a Spanish fly. I apologize if I'm wrong. I'm not perfect on, on all of these moves. Uh, I think it was a Spanish fly, though. Someone can probably correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, off the ropes into the table. It was great. That was my favorite moment of the match. Really good. Really good overall. Um, it was a lot of fun. It was a, it was a, it was a good match. Not a great match, but it was a good match. Uh, a lot of really great moments. I think everybody did kind of have their little spots to shine, except for LA Knight, which was kind of strange. Um, but I think the right man won. Personally, I think uh, I really like how this kind of sets up with the with the Judgment Day and my thought process. Given that uh, another match later on on the card is the World Heavyweight Title between uh, the current champion Seth Rollins and Finn Balor, who was the leader of the Judgment Day. 
my immediate thought and why I thought Damian Priest was going to win in the first place was this could cause some drama with the Judgment Day in the World Heavyweight match because obviously Damian Priest isn't going to cash in his money in the bank on Roman Reigns. That ain't happening. So what else would it be? It would be Seth Rollins in the World Heavyweight. So it was like they, they're trying to create some drama with the Judgment Day. This is what I think is going to happen. And we'll get to it when we get to it. But that's, that's why I thought Damian Priest was going to win. Damian Priest did win. Good match. I really like the men's money in the bank. It wasn't my favorite, but it was good. So moving on. Next was the women's tag team championship match. It was uh, Shayna Baszler and Ronda Rousey, who were the reigning champions against Raquel Rodriguez and Liv Morgan. And oh, this was this was a weird one to me, honestly. I, I didn't hate it. it. It was a good match, but it, I don't even think it was as good as the men's money in the bank. And... There were a couple reasons for it. Uh, I don't know if this is a, a, a kayfabe injury or if it was a real injury that happened with Liv Morgan with her shoulder. Um, I'm going to guess it was a real injury. I, I don't really keep up with, with all of these things that happen, especially since I don't watch super, super frequently anymore. But um, the storyline was Liv Morgan was coming back from a, uh, a shoulder injury, and that's why her and Raquel had to give up the belts they had to relinquish them, and this is them trying to, like, you know, these were our belts, we never actually lost them, we deserve to get them back, and Liv felt really sluggish, she, like, her, her, her style felt really slow, like, she was, maybe not, I, I, it's hard to say when somebody's gonna be 100% back to normal, and I'm not trying to throw any shade at Liv Morgan because I think she did good as a whole but she did feel a little slow and a little rusty so it did kind of I did kind of notice maybe a couple of botches here and there and a lot of setups that were a little too easily made and you know no fault to anybody it's it's hard to come back from an injury so you know credit where it's due for her to even just come back and perform at the level that she did but I did notice that she was seeming a little slow uh, and a little out of it, but it didn't affect the quality near as much, I felt, as the fact that I did not really feel like Ronda Rousey and Shayna Baszler were really kind of there fully for the match, especially Ronda. She just kind of, I don't want to say it felt like she phoned it in, but it really felt like she didn't care a huge, huge amount. So, and I, I think that kind of shows when you, when you see what happened with the storyline of the match, where... Not really too... I don't, it wasn't that long of a match. It was like less than 10 minutes long. And uh, Ronda's about to end it. And uh, Shayna comes and attacks her from behind and beats her up. Really kind of... Caught me caught me by surprise, personally. I, I had no idea that that was coming. And I guess they're setting up uh, a singles match between the two of them. Now that their their whole thing is broken. So Shayna attacked Ronda from behind essentially took her out, allowing uh, Liv and Raquel to, to get the win pretty easily, which I think that's that's fine storytelling. I I'm, I think that was the right outcome, was for uh, Liv and, and uh, Raquel to get the, the belts back. So it was a good result. Uh, not not the best match, not the worst by any means. Uh, just kind of felt like a, a very mid-tier match. Not, not bad, but not great. So yeah. Um, oh, I should also mention... Um, Rhonda came out wearing a, a Saiyan armor top and a Majin M on her head, and as I understand it, I'm not I'm not into Warhammer, but I am wanting to get into it. Um, I read that that Shayna wore uh, Warhammer armor for her outfit as well, which is really cool. I love I love when uh, we see kind of nerdy things like that happen in uh, with the, with the with the superstars. So that's a lot of fun. I love when when superstars kind of do that with their outfit. They have the, those influences that they wear literally on their sleeve uh somewhat so that was that was fun seeing that i did think the majin m was a little goofy especially when it was peeling off after she got attacked by by Shayna. but it's it's fun to see wrestlers do that now and again so that that was fun that was a nice little bit of wardrobe anyways uh intercontinental match came up next uh gunther versus uh, uh gunther versus matt riddle um this match felt like filler I don't know why it was in this pay-per-view. It was because there's there's no world where, where Matt Riddle beats Gunther, especially with Gunther coming this close to the Honky Tonk Man's record for the Intercontinental belt. 
And the way that they've built Gunther up to where back in, um, was it Mania or Elimination Chamber? I, I'm, I'm getting them a little mixed up. I think it was Mania, though I could be, it could have been sooner. It could have been an Elimination Chamber. It doesn't matter. Point being, one of the earlier pay-per-views was the triple threat match between Gunther, Sheamus, and Drew McIntyre, which was a very good match. A great showcase of these three powerhouses just really brawling. And the whole when I was watching that match, the whole time I was thinking, Sheamus and Drew are focusing way too much on themselves, and they're going to gas themselves out enough to let Gunther get an easy win. And that's basically what happened. And I think that was the right call, because it was the whole storyline was them feeling like they uh Seamus feeling like Drew betrayed him and that that cost both of them the chance at the belt so that was that was correct but to to think that Matt Riddle which I mean no offense to Matt Riddle at all the dude is very talented uh and I don't much I don't much care for the gimmick they have going for him I think that whole like dude bro like oh yeah I smoke weed it's it's like really it's 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 very stereotypical <laughs> it's that it's that Somebody who doesn't smoke weed, what they imagine someone from California who smokes weed and surfs acts like. I don't much care for the character too much, but it's whatever. I, I don't hate Riddle by any means. I think he's very fun. I think he's talented. And I did... I enjoyed the the time, the, uh, the RK bro, as they called it, the tag team with him and Randy Orton. That was a very weird, goofy... It, I can't believe... Like, it, does, it wouldn't work on paper, but it actually did work in execution kind of thing. So... By by no means, no shade against Riddle. The dude is entertaining, he's talented, he's fun. But I don't think he had any business being in an Intercontinental match versus Gunther. It just, it really felt like filler. I, I don't know, it, just, it felt like they, they, they thought that they needed to have another title match on the card. And obviously they weren't going to have the Undisputed title because of the, the Bloodline Civil War. They didn't have any of the women's titles, even though Rhea Ripley was there supporting Dominic. And uh, Oscar just just wasn't there to begin with, so they didn't have those titles being uh, done. Uh, the the tag the men's tag team undisputed tag teams weren't uh, defended either. The United States title I feel like the United States title could have really gone here if you really wanted another one. Just take the belt from Austin Theory. He doesn't deserve it. But what that's a different story. But I just I don't know. It felt like they just they they picked this match because they wanted to fill up another slot. And I just. I didn't feel like this match belonged. I felt like uh, Riddle really couldn't get any momentum going. He had like one 30-second stint where he was able to get a pin, but obviously Gunther kicked out of it, and that was like all Riddle got. Otherwise, it was just Gunther just being a powerhouse on him and getting a what feels like a pretty easy win. And I feel like if they really wanted to, to use this as a way to build Riddle up, they could have done it better. But as it stands, it, it felt like it wasn't a squash match, but it felt like it was almost a squash match. So, I don't know. I, I think the real reason they did it was for Drew McIntyre's comeback because he's been out since since that match. I, I, I read, I think it was because of injuries, an actual injury. So now he's back. I also heard that there may have been a contract, uh, a contract dispute that's now been fixed. Uh, so I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I know a lot of these are rumors. A lot of these are hearsay and a lot of them are probably false point being Drew's been gone since their, their triple threat match. And now he's back and now he's coming to challenge Gunther on a one-on-one -on -one for the belt, which I feel like the storyline they were making with Sheamus, it probably should have been Sheamus coming out because, you know, just, just let the man complete, complete the set. I feel like a good way to do it would have been having Sheamus come out, Sheamus be the one that beats Gunther, and then you can restart a rivalry with, with Sheamus and Drew. Maybe they're doing the opposite, where Drew comes and gets the belt from Gunther, and then Sheamus and him duke it out, and Sheamus will finally get his first ever Intercontinental Championship. That might be how they're doing it. They might not. That might not be how they're doing it. They might have it be where Gunther beats Drew one-on-one, -on -one and then Sheamus comes out. Or Sheamus has gone out of the picture completely. I don't know. But... As it stands, I think it was a good moment for for Drew coming out and having his little getting over with the crowd bit. It was fun. It was better than the match itself. And I'm looking forward to seeing where this goes because I think Gunther is a really imposing figure. So I think having someone that's equally imposing is more important for, for the belt than, I'm sorry, than Matt Riddle. So, like I said, the match felt like filler, but I feel like it was done purely for McIntyre to come back out, which 
was a good moment, all things considered. But moving on, we got Cody Rhodes and Dominic Mysterio. Ugh, oh, my God. Um, wow. I preferred the Intercontinental match, if I'm being honest. Uh, so just my thoughts, my thoughts on both of these wrestlers. I don't like Dominic Mysterio. Uh, Rey Mysterio has been one of my favorites since I was a little kid, all the way back in the 90s. Uh, loved watching him. Loved watching him and Eddie. Uh, loved watching him by himself. I love when they had that that those whole like David versus Goliath things, where it'd be like Ray versus the Undertaker, Ray versus Brock. You, you know, all of these just seemingly impossible things. And a lot of the times, it felt like he would they would set him up just to get squashed, and that sucked. But then you had those couple of matches they did where he would actually win, and it felt like a really earned win. And Ray is a fantastic wrestler, and he's still one of my favorites. He's great, and I just don't really feel like that magic exists with his son, and I don't like this whole Judgment Day thing with him. I, I don't know. I just I don't think he he's a very good heel, at all. I don't think he's a very good wrestler. I, I he's like I mean you know he's better than me, which is not saying a lot for me. But I mean the the dude's good enough to be there. I, I will say like he's not talentless. But he, I just don't think he's really entertaining to watch. A lot of what he does is just either uh, copying what Ray does or copying what Eddie did. And I don't really enjoy that personally. I, I'm all for having people ha show their reverence for Eddie Guerrero and doing Three Amigos or doing his... Uh, I'm doing it right now. The thing where he sticks his arms out and he shakes his chest, you know, his little taunt. Like, that, you know, it's all fun and good and whatnot. But going back to the build-up to Mania, I think it was Mania. I'm, I apologize if I'm getting these these pay-per-views wrong. It's it's been it's been a it's been a long year already. Uh, with his building up to his match versus Ray, he had the comment, "I wish I was Eddie's son," and I felt like that was just incredibly out of line, even for even for kayfabe, just to to have that brought up, both to Ray and in reference to Eddie. So I just, I don't know. I feel like the writing for Dom is just really not very good. <laughs> but, and I, I don't think he can carry it very well. I think he's 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 crushing real hard on, on Rhea Ripley. So I don't really much care for Dominic Mysterio. And I think this heel run for him is just, it's about as good as that mullet is on him, which is to say not at all. And so now we have Cody Rhodes. Uh, I just, I don't like Cody Rhodes. I don't know what it is. I just I don't find him entertaining. If you do, more power to you. It's just something about Cody. I just I it just it doesn't click with me. There, I, it's not the talent. It's not there's not a lack of talent. The dude, he's good at what he does. But it's just I don't know. I, I maybe it's his his personality on the mic. Maybe it's what he doesn't do in the ring. I don't know. But something about Cody just doesn't click with me. I didn't like Stardust. I didn't like Cody Rhodes in AEW. And I don't like Cody Rhodes once again in WWE. I, I'm I'm sorry. I just I don't know what it is. It's just something about Cody Rhodes just really doesn't click with me. I don't hate him, but I don't really like him either. I, I really can take or leave him. So I didn't have I I mean I felt like if anyone was going to win it should be Cody because he's far and away the better wrestler. So yeah. But I just I don't honestly care for either of these, so this match was kind of a wash for me. But if there's one thing I can't, I cannot stand, is these really dumb cat and mouse games where you have the obvious heel character, and they know that they're not as good as the as the baby face they're facing, and so they'll just do some like hit and run tactics, or they'll run out of the ring and run around in circles and have them be chased and like, oh, I can't fight them one on one truly. Ooh, it's just it's stupid. I don't like it. It's it wastes time. All it does is make the heel look like a dumbass. It's I don't care for it, and Dom was doing that, and it just it is that that's the, I don't I don't really get into that. Just you know, I I, I like my heels good, I you know I like them them well performed, and the, this whole like just talking a big game, and then as soon as they're stood face to face, they run. It's just lame. I just find it really lame, and I feel like Dominic is the most generic heel that you can have. I mean that he has he has all of the the check boxes of a generic heel. He, he talks a lot of shit, can't back it up, runs away, 
hides behind his uh, authority figure, which in this case is Rhea Ripley, who very much has earned her spot. And it's just, I, I don't find it entertaining. If you do, great, more power to you. I'm really glad that you do. But for me, it just doesn't work for me. So this match didn't really work for me. I'm glad Cody won. That was the right outcome. That was the obvious outcome. But it just, I, I don't know. I, I feel like Dom is still that little kid who's trying to play with the adults. And I don't know. His 619 looks looks really weak. It, it doesn't it doesn't have that speed and impact that Ray has. So I, I don't know. I, I can't really believe his his 619s either. But I don't know. Another another kind of filler match for me personally, but. You know, whatever. You, you you can't. Not every match is going to be perfect in every pay per view. Moving on, we have uh, John Cena with his surprise coming out to say, "Hey, everybody, I still exist." By the way, remember the ten, fifteen years where I was being pushed all over the place and you couldn't get rid of me. So I I, I don't I don't like John Cena, the wrestler. For the record, I he was one of the reasons why I stopped watching for a long time because I didn't like his shtick. I didn't like his shtick when it was, uh, thugonomics when he, not when he first premiered, but when, when, when the John Cena character first finally came about with the, 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 the first somewhat permanent John Cena character, it was like what, 2002 or 2003 when that happened. I don't remember, but when he came out with the whole thugonomics thing and, uh, I didn't like that shtick. And then he, he did the you can't see me thing like a couple years later and it kind of built into the character that he became and I just didn't care for it. It's, I don't know, John Cena's never been for me. Uh, John Cena, the person, I've heard nothing but good things about him. The Make-A-Wish thing, obviously, everyone knows the Make-A-Wish thing. Nothing but respect for John Cena, the person. John Cena, the actor, no no real complaints there. He seems like a very good actor, whatever. Uh, I enjoyed I, I thought he was fantastic in the Suicide Squad. I haven't watched Peacemaker yet. I've heard it's really good. I want to. Still haven't watched it. Whatever. I've heard he's great in it. So John Cena, the actor, I can get behind. Uh, John Cena, the person, I can get behind. John Cena, the wrestler, I just can't do it. It's I've ne I, it's been 20 years and I still can't do it. So I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's just how I feel about John Cena, the wrestler. But um, I do find it funny that uh, someone who is seen as like one of the biggest company men in the world for the WWE comes out and cuts an anti-establishment promo. I, I just, you know, I kind of roll my eyes at that. You know, oh, they don't, they don't like you London, but I like you like, which I will say that London crowd was fantastic. Uh, I have not seen a crowd at a, at a WWE pay-per-view pop off near as much as that London crowd did. So I will agree with John Cena, send a WrestleMania to London. Great idea. That crowd deserves it. They were fantastic. They elevated that show. Normally, the crowd is just kind of a presence that doesn't really mean much to me personally, to my viewing experience. Maybe like, you know, when I was a kid and Curry Angle would come out and everyone's chanting, you suck, which I've been to Raw a couple of times and I was part of that you suck chant here and there when I was a kid. So, you know, it's it's fun. It's fun to be in the moment of that. Like, you know, stuff like that is, is always fun. But normally, I feel like the crowd isn't really a presence outside of just background noise. But I feel like this London crowd really was a presence at this pay-per-view. So, yes, I agree with you, John. Let's get a WrestleMania in London. It'll probably be 41 or 42 because 40 is going to be in Philly next year. So, great crowd. Um, loved the crowd. They had amazing participation. They did great. I'll talk more about that in the main event. And then Grayson Waller comes out and just does his little heel. Oh, London sucks. I'm from Australia. I'm sorry, Australians. I can't do an Australian accent. Uh, you know, let's bring it to Australia. And eh, it, it was just, you know, it, it was just a little promo bit. Whatever. It, it didn't really mean much to me, but especially since I really don't know much about Grayson Waller. Basically nothing at all. I don't watch his show. I'm not going to. It's not for me, but whatever. And of course, he hits Cena from behind, but then Cena's like, oh, you want to fight? F you. Boom. Yay, I'm John Cena. Woo. And that's that. I don't. Was, I feel like that was there more for the crowd, which is fine. It wasn't for me. It was for the crowd, and the crowd deserved it. They were fantastic, so I'm okay with what happened. It was, it was a fun little bit for them. Let's bring WrestleMania to London. Moving on. The women's money in the bank match. Ooh. Ooh, I cannot say enough good things about this one. Oh. God, this was one of the best matches of the night. It was not the match of the night. And I'm sure everybody probably agrees on what the match of the night was. But, ooh, the women's money in the bank was almost. It was so close. It would have been if not for the main event. 
phenomenal, phenomenal match. Um, let's looking at the lineup real quick. So we got um, Bailey, Becky Lynch, Trish Stratus, Zelina Vega, Zoe Stark, and Io Sky. Uh, I don't know too much about Zoe Stark, and I've only recently learned about Io Sky and Zelina Vega, because I'm you know once again I, I don't follow this heavily heavily. I just catch it here and there when I can, and try and make sure that I'm full up on the storylines by the time the pay per views come around. Uh, I liked what I saw of Zelina Vega at uh, Backlash. I thought she was really fun. I didn't think she was going to win the title, but she had a great performance, and the crowd was over on her. And I I liked what I saw. I thought that, you know, she's a very, very talented superstar, and I think that she should get a push eventually. Same with uh, Io, Io Sky. I think she's really talented, and, yeah, it's she's fun to watch, and I think she deserves a push as well. Zoe Stark, like I said, I don't really know anything about her other than what happened with her with uh, interfering with uh, Becky and Trish in their match, in their one-on-one match. So... I can't really say much, and I really don't think she showed a huge amount in this match, which it's really hard to when there's five other superstars competing for screen time as well. So I'm sorry. I, I just I don't really have anything I can really say about Zoe Stark because I just haven't seen her personally. Uh, Trish Stratus grew up watching her when back when the diva thing was more about sex appeal than it was about wrestling, but Trish was fun. Always enjoyed watching her. Not the biggest fan of this heel run, personally. I get it. I, I I get it, but it's it's fine. It's not it's not offensively bad. I don't think it's great, but it's it's fine. It's inoffensive. It's it's something for Becky to do while Becky's not title chasing. Uh, Bailey. Bailey is a weird one for me because I really like her, but I don't always like what she's doing. And damage control is fine. Uh, I think, for me personally, Peak Bailey was her and Sasha Banks as tag partners. I loved that stint. I loved the two of them together. I thought they worked great together. I love both of them. Uh, and now she's she you know had the bit where I think it was because she was injured and she couldn't wrestle where she was like a manager, and that bit was kind of goofy, but whatever. And then she got cleared, I think, and came back to wrestle, and it's that's great because I think she's very talented, and she's very entertaining to watch, and now she's got damage control with um, Io Sky and um, Dakota Kai, and yeah, I, I think she's working as a mentor right now for the two of them, at least for Kayfabe, and I think that's fine. I, I don't really have any issues with Bailey. I think she's kind of goofy at times, and like I said, I don't always love what they do, what, how they use her and what they do with her, but... I think she's fun. I think she's talented. No real issues with Bailey whatsoever. And then Becky Lynch, who is I'm I'm gonna sound so stereotypical and like a you know a, a very generic wrestling fan. Becky's my favorite female superstar. I she's great. I, there really is like so much to love about her. Her style, her attitude, just she's she's so much fun to watch. She's so much fun to listen to on the mic. She's got a really great presence. And she's got really fun moves. I, I don't know. Becky's great. She's she's really fun. Like, I, I don't really know what else to say. She's she's my favorite female superstar on the roster right now. And I understand why they're not pushing her to be a a champion right now. She's had her time. Now let's let's get some of the younger people in there. I agree with that. I'd like her to have a couple more title runs in her time, but. I think right now it's good to keep her relevant in some storylines that are more focused on her. I would like her to win a Money in the Bank one of these days, but I'm okay with it not having been this time. So my heart, once again, I wanted Becky to win. My head, I felt like it was going to be become be between Io Sky and Zelina Vega. Honestly, I, I couldn't I couldn't pick one over the other. If I had to pick one. I, I could have just as easily come up with a reason for one over the other. So I just, I felt it was 50-50 for me, but I, I knew it was going to be either EOS guy or Zelina Vega. It ended up being EOS guy, and, oh, God, just great match from start to finish. It was really good. I didn't think there were any down bits. I felt like going into it, because the history that Trish and Zoe have with Becky, I felt like that feud was going to basically stop Becky from being able to win. And in a, in a manner in a manner of speaking that is what happened. 
but it didn't take up as much as I thought it would. I thought it would basically dominate the three of them, and it would basically be a triple threat ladder match between Zelina Vega, Eosky, and Bailey. Thankfully, that wasn't the case. It was at first, but then it just kind of permeated, and we did get a great little bit where Trish and Becky teamed up for one move and then did the whole like slowly looking at each other and then start beating each other. You know, that's we've seen it many times. It's fun. Uh, so I'm glad that it didn't take up basically the entirety of the match. There were some really great spots from all, all of them. Uh, I thought that once the, uh, the, the handcuffs came out that, uh, Something was going to happen, and Becky was going to get handcuffed to either Trish or Zoe. I thought the handcuff cuff bit was really good, and I'm glad it didn't end up with them just clipping her to the ropes and taking her out of the match completely. That would have been such a lackluster thing to do, and I'm really glad they didn't do that. Uh, I thought she was going to get handcuffed to one of the other two. So, I was kind of half right, and I'm, I'm glad I was wrong where I was wrong. So, um, one thing I found funny, I thought I got a really good chuckle out of this, was the announcer, when Bailey was coming out, she said Bailey representing the Judgment Day. It was, it was a misspeak. It happens. You know, we're all human. Uh, I just, I got a good chuckle out of that and was like, haha, anyways. But, you know, just wanted to point that out. It was, it was a funny little thing. It happens. You know, everybody makes their mistakes. It's not that big of a deal. But it gave me a good chuckle all the, all the same. Um... I thought that uh, some of the better moments in the match, just the single singular moments that really stood out to me, were um, the moonsault by uh, Io that took out, took out almost everyone. That was a really fun moment. Uh, climbing up almost all the way to the top of the ladder outside of the ring, really, really great moment. A great way of keeping her over with the with the crowd. Really fun moments. Uh, as the feud really heated up between Becky, Trish, and Zoe, I thought that there were a lot of really great moments there, like with Becky taking Trish out by doing the uh, the manhandle, is it called the manhandle slam on onto the onto the onto the ladder. Good moments. Uh, when uh, Zelina was at the top of the la- uh, top of the ladder, pulling out the flip flop and doing the whole, you know. This, this happened in, in Backlash also, getting the flip-flop from her mom. But now she pulled the flip-flop out and was, like, striking them with it. Like, that, that was a funny little bit. That was good. Uh, it, it's nice to have these little moments of levity in it. So, th- those are fun. Um, then Bailey knocked Io off the ladder, which I, I expected there to be a, a bit of a... a, bit of a, a a minor betrayal because you know it's it's a it's a money in the bank match this is going to happen like even the even the strongest teams a lot of the time there will be small cracks that appear it's just kind of the nature of what these matches tend to bring so i i did i did uh i did expect that that turn but i welcomed it at the same time uh it was a very very strong moment it was great for eo's character and then, oh, the end of the match. So Becky and Bailey are battling it out on the ladder. Uh, Becky uses the handcuffs on 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 Bailey, kind of fish hooks her with it, and then Eo pops up and handcuffs the two of them together through the the rungs of the ladder, and she climbs up past Bailey and takes the the briefcase. Perfect finish. Absolutely perfect finish. That's how it should have ended. I cannot think of it going any better even though i wanted becky to personally win i think the way that eo won was even better i loved it this match was fantastic and (laughs) i i just you know you can see bailey i don't know if this was her breaking character or if this was just part of the storyline too you could tell that she was really happy for eo it was a really great moment for her it was really well done it was a great match one of of the best ones of the night one of the best ones in my opinion period it was one of the better money in the bank matches in recent in recent history it was a really good match, so I'm really happy with how that one turned out. So, if there's any any takeaways from Money in the Bank, it's watch the women's match and watch the main event because those were by far the best two matches of the night. I loved them. Those two alone made the made the pay per view worth it, but there were still plenty of other good matches. And with that, let's get into the world heavyweight match between Seth Rollins and Finn Balor. Uh, whew. Seth Rollins is interesting. I like him. I think he's he's fun. 
I think he's he's really entertaining. He's very talented. His eccentricities that have seemed to have been built up in recent years are I I don't know, man. I I it's it's nothing nothing bad at all. It's it's hard to explain, but it's just it's an interesting thing when you don't know what Seth is going to come out wearing. And his wardrobe is one of the best parts of his eccentricities now. It's it's just it's a lot of fun. The dude has great presence. He knows how to work a crowd. The everyone chanting the the woes with his um with his opening with his with his entrance his entrance music. Like yeah, like I said, the dude knows how to work a crowd. He's very entertaining. He's able to work really well in the ring. The dude's just a straight up just massive talent. And I'm really glad that he has been retained as a relevant and important mainstay to the roster all these years later because he does deserve it. And I'm glad that he's not constantly fighting for the spotlight along with Roman Reigns and all of this. So Seth is great. I don't think he's the best, but he's definitely up there. He's a main eventer for sure. He's really good. Finn Balor... I don't think he's as good as Seth personally. I have I have no real issues with Finn Balor. If I if I had to if I had to pick one thing, if I just had to pick one thing with Finn Balor to say that is I'm not personally a fan of, I think his entrances as the demon can sometimes be a little too long. I think they build atmosphere fantastically when he does do it, but sometimes watching him crawl to the ring for like three to four minutes it, it, it gets kind of old. So if, if I had to pull something negative to say about him, it would be that. But the dude's very talented. Um, he can work a mic well enough. I don't think he's the best, but he, he, he is above average for sure. He's got some very, very great technical skills. Um, he's a really good high flyer. He's, he's very talented. My only issue generally, and this is not with him, is I do feel like he gets mismatched a lot. Uh, kind of similar to what I was saying earlier with like Rey Mysterio having these David versus Goliath matches, but I feel like with Finn Balor, sometimes they do things like that, but then they just kind of squash him, and I, I I don't know. I his his feud with Edge was entertaining, and that was a really good match. Uh, back in one of the previous pay per views. So it seems like they've gotten kind of better with handling him, but I do feel like he does get mismatched a little bit here and there. But I do feel like his matchup with Seth was very good. It fit him a lot better than some other things I've seen him in in the past. So this was a great way to kind of showcase both of their strengths. So this was a very good matchup, all things considered. Going into it, knowing that Damian Priest had won the men's money in the bank earlier in the night, I was of three minds about it. I was thinking that either Seth would win, then Damien would come out and cash his, his thing and take the belt, and that would make a uh, an idea of how he stole the chance from Finn Balor and set, set some cracks in for the Judgment Day. Uh, or Finn would win, and then Damien would come out and steal the belt from him, literally, and an even bigger crack would form. That would that'd probably honestly break the Judgment Day if that happened. Or he wouldn't come out at all. That's kind of where I was sitting. We got something kind of in the middle, and I think it was better than what I was thinking. So I think they handled it really good. Um, there were some really great executions. There were some really great moments from both of them. I think they both hit their spots really well. Uh, they did a really good job with the back and forth momentum swings. And then Damian Priest came out midway through the match, pulled up a chair, and just sat down. And, ah, uh, man, it created so much tension. It, it was a great atmosphere. It really kind of changed the tone of the second half of the match. And I loved it. It was so good. They used it perfectly and Seth ended up winning because Damien got up and acted like he was about to cash it in which distracted Finn long enough for Seth to counterattack to recover and counterattack and then get the win 
so the cracks are there. But then he didn't cash in the briefcase. He still held on to it. And man, like I said, I said my three ideas, and it was none of them. It was kind of that he didn't cash it in, but I didn't expect him to come out and not cash it. I didn't think he would come out if he wasn't going to cash it at all. So I was wrong on all accounts. And boy, this was so much better than any idea that I could have had. I love it. This is going to set up some great storylines for the Judgment Day moving forward. Seth is able to keep his belt since he seems to be the face of Raw right now. And they're pushing the whole World Heavyweight belt for Raw. Which, this is fine. This was a great outcome. Great storytelling on this one. Really, really, really good. Really great match overall. Oh, now into the main event. The Bloodline Civil War Tag Team Match. The Usos versus Roman Reigns and their brother, Solo Sokoa. Uh, I have some some choice opinions about Roman Reigns and his title run. Uh, I don't like it. I don't like this Roman Reigns title run. I think it's been frustrating to say the least it's been almost three years now and i have been real real off and on watching because of it because i cannot i I can only watch roman get his ass kicked in a main event only for the referee to get taken out and the usos or more recently solo sokoa come in run some interference on the opponent and allow roman to eke out the win it's it's so frustrating. It's so annoying. It's so tiresome to watch over and over and over and over again. And it's not even that I don't want this title reign to last this long. I'm okay with it being this long, but it needs to have some legitimacy. And you can't have almost every single pay-per-view main event end dirty like that. It really delegitimizes his run. And, like, yeah, it's all fake. They have all of these storylines going on. Like, yes, I get it. I get it. This this title run lasts only as long as the writers want it to. I imagine Roman has some in, in input on some things about it. But at the end of the day, if the writers wanted to end this reign, they would have ended it. So it's going on because they wanted to keep going. And that's fine. That's not the issue. The issue is just how bad the execution has been at times. Like, I just, I, I can't stand how many times he's been he's won dirty give him some clean wins like have him show that he deserves this like the whole thing is the whole acknowledge me and it's like i can't i can't even like begrudgingly acknowledge him if he keeps winning dirty and he only wins because of the bloodline it's for me it just makes it tired and i just don't want to watch and it's been causing me to not watch a lot because I just don't care. The writers have really taken out any realism or any entertainment for me personally to this title reign. And it's, it really isn't Roman's fault. Like, it, he's had his issues in the past about how... I don't want to say boring, because that's not how I mean it, but how unenthused he's been in the past. And I honestly, I've never really had too many issues with Roman in the past. Like, yeah, if I had to, at least as of like three or four years ago, if I had to say who I thought was the worst member of the Shield, I would have said him. Sure. But I do think he's gotten a lot better in recent years. I think he's gotten better on the mic. I think he's gotten better in the ring. I still think that Superman punch being hit, one of his signatures, is just really lame. Like, I'm sorry... I find that move really lame. I don't think anybody can really sell it very well. Maybe Brock Lesnar, but I don't think he would ever sink to that level because, I mean, come on, you got people having top rope superplexes or these crazy frog splashes or all of these other moves, and you know, they kick out of them, and it's all like heightened tension. And then this dude just kind of runs across the ring with a six-inch vertical and gives you a little pop on the face, and then suddenly you're down for the count. Like, it's just... I can't believe uh, a Superman punch. I, I I just I can't buy it personally. So take that for what you will. But yeah, I just I wish that the writing for this in terms of in the ring 
has I wish it's been better because it's really taken me out of wanting to watch WWE a lot of the time because like I said I just I hate watching him win dirty every single time legitimize his run by having him win clean if you want us to believe that he is a dominant force that he is greatness on a different level show it right have him win clean have him dominate someone get an e- have someone be built up as someone that could realistically take him down and then have him crush him just squash him completely like that would mean a lot more to his to legitimize his title run than if Jey Uso came gave him a super kick and then Roman got an easy pin like there there are things here that you can do to help Roman out and they just it feels like they haven't been doing it and they've been it's it's been a disservice to Roman and it's been a disservice to the title run so anyway with that out of the way I had been struggling also over these last couple of years to really kind of feel positive towards the Usos because of once again the writing of it it's just you know it it, a similar thing to Roman Reigns but with the tag team belts and I felt like they were being underutilized, but they were still being pushed being these, like, title holders. And it's not that I felt like they didn't deserve it, because they're really talented. They're really great wrestlers, and they have great chemistry together. But I feel like the writing was holding me back t- from really being fans of the Usos. So, needless to say, once we got the build-up to this Bloodline Civil War... I finally started coming around to them because I felt like the writing was finally giving them some actual service. It it felt like they were finally being utilized correctly in the storyline, and it was able to put actual feeling, actual emotion into their matches, and not just look at these guys wrestle because we want them to win. It felt like look at these guys fighting to win because they feel like they need to. It's the little things like that, the little things, a little thing called context that can really change someone's view on a match. And that was the difference maker for me going into this. Not like it's, oh man, the, the emotions I felt at night of champions when Jimmy super kicked Roman twice, when he finally snapped and he said, enough is enough. This is it. And the feeling when Jay was like, you're out of the family, and I'm coming with you. And he super kicked Roman as well. I, I think it was on SmackDown a couple weeks later. Those moments are so good. And yes, you can make the argument that all of these years of, of writing for the storyline have built up to this moment, and it does make it sweeter. And yes, you'd, you'd be right that like all of this buildup has really helped this this these moments really have that weight to it and really help the usos and finally at least for me personally getting over so yes i will say that this execution here at the end of the bloodline or at least the beginning of the end of the bloodline i would say as of right now it's worth the two years of me just being frustrated and hating the storyline and just wanting anything to happen these moments really, really popped for me, and it's great. So I went into this match being like, finally, I can have something that I can just really get behind with the Usos and really be in their corner and love these guys for what they do instead of hating them for being how they're used with with the Bloodline storyline. So it was great. I think this match was perfect. The first half of it, was very slow it was all about building the atmosphere building the tension and that is exactly how it should have been there was not a huge amount of action but there was so much story being told in the ring and that is how you do it it's perfect i can't say anything bad about it i can't say enough good about it that is how you tell a story in the ring is perfect absolutely perfect and in a similar vein to jump back before the match started having uh, Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn in the box and having a little interview with them before the match started and them essentially being on the Uso side that was a fun little bit and especially since Zami uh, especially since Sami has been pushed really hard recently which quick side quick aside about Sami Zayn 
Ah, oh, man, it's been so hard for me to like him in the past because he's been used as a joke. Like, you know, in WrestleMania last year, he lost to, to, to Johnny Knoxville and was pinned inside of a giant mouse trap. Like, Sami Zayn has been a joke character for so long, and I've I've hated it. Like, I just, I don't, I don't much care for these joke characters personally. That's just my preference. I don't really care for these characters that exist only to try and make kids laugh. It's not why I watch. It's fine that it exists. I'm not saying it shouldn't exist because, you know, there's a bunch of different people that watch for different reasons. Having all of these different characters for all of these different audiences is totally fine. But for me personally, Sammy never hit for me because I didn't care for these joke characters. And I felt like Sammy had been horribly, horribly underutilized for years and years because of it. So for them to, this year, starting this year, maybe a little bit into last year with him being part of the bloodline, but really, really this year, having him be taken seriously, having him have real matches, having him be able to showcase his talent in the ring, his talent on the mic, really getting that front and center this year has been so refreshing. It's been one of my favorite parts of any storytelling in the WWE this year because it shows that they have this talent and if they use it correctly, great things can come out of it. And you didn't even need Sammy to win in Montreal. He didn't win in Montreal at, uh, at Elimination Chamber, but he didn't need to because they utilized him correctly. And that is something that I feel like they don't always do right, but when they do, it hits so hard and so good. And Sami Zayn is a perfect example of that. The Usos in this match is a perfect example of that. I want more of this. This is so good. This is what makes watching it so much fun. So, anyways, to the match itself, it's fantastic. This is a match that I feel like I have been waiting for for two years or more. This is what I've been needing in the WWE with this Bloodline storyline. It's so perfect. And what I really wanted, what I expected, was the Usos to win. What I wanted was for Jay to pin Roman. What I thought would happen was... Jay or Jimmy, it didn't really matter which one pinning Solo, because for months and months, it's only been Roman hasn't been pinned since December 2019 did you know Roman hasn't been pinned in almost four years over and over, Michael Cole's been talking about how Roman hasn't been pinned for so long and I know that they're using that to build up how big the pop-off's gonna be when he finally gets pinned but I did not think they'd do it now I figured they'd save it for when he finally loses the belts, so that you get that extra, extra big pop-off However, we know that's not what happened, and I'm so glad that's how it, how it went down, because I wanted Jay to pin him so badly, I just did not think they had the balls to do it. But before we get there, I talked earlier about how the London crowd was such a great presence at the pay-per-view, and I feel like this main event is the perfect example of that. It was so much fun listening to them react to Roman and watching Roman react to them in turn oh my god if you hate Roman stand up if you know what I'm talking about if you watched it that moment where the fans put themselves into the match when the fans became a fifth combatant in the match it was so so good that is a WWE crowd, and that is why we need a mania in London. We need that energy. It was so powerful. It was so good. I want that in every pay-per-view. That's asking a lot, I understand, but oh, we need that. That crowd was so perfect, and Roman played it perfectly. Credit where it's due. He took it on the chin and played the character he needed to play to absolute perfection all of them chanting if you hate Roman stand up and his response is to sit on the apron and pout perfect absolute perfection Roman I hate you a lot but I love you for that so good I love it Roman deserves so much credit for this match for so many reasons 
and him acting like a brat, him acting like a child, him losing his composure, it it's some of the best performance art in WWE in recent times. So I have so many issues with how this Roman Reigns title run has gone. I have so many issues with how the last three years have gone with this. But God, when they do it right, it hits so good. So Roman Reigns, I love you. Great job. I hope you lose so bad. I hope you lose these titles. I want you to lose these titles. But I love you for how you did this this match. Perfection. Greatness. I love it. Great job, dude. Mm, just so good around or across the whole match. Solo Sokoa did so good with just conveying everything he was feeling, conveying what was going on in the match purely through facial features. Great job. Like, this dude is better than I feel like we we think he is. So I, I really hope Solo gets a lot of success throughout the years because he did so much with so little. A lot of credit there, too. And, of course, you know, the Usos, they just, they came out and they put on a show. Great job. Oh, they had such great energy when they had their moments, when they had their big momentum swings, and it was one or the other coming out and just having their moments where they just kicked ass and showed their dominance. It was it was perfect. It was so fun. I, um, man. Jay... Uso is one of the most electrifying men in sports entertainment. It's so fun to watch him go off. Like, ah, oh, man. These guys earned it. It was so good. Mm. And going into this, oh, God, we had the flashback to Mania, what was it, two years ago with uh, Daniel Bryan and Edge in the Triple Threat match, and that match pissed me off so much. I was seething at the end of that match with when he stacked him up and I was part of the crowd that was just like, well, technically Edge was on top of Daniel, so he got the three count first too. He won. Like just trying to cope for it because this the storyline was just so messy back then. I, it's been messy for a long, long time. I, I feel personally, I think this is when it's finally beginning really good. But so to have him almost have that again and have both of them kick out in that moment was was great man this match was so good I, I feel like i could talk about it for so long it was just it was great all around great performances from all four people uh great tension just great great performances i just i, I don't know it was just a phenomenal match this was a five-star match this was perfect this was the best match of the year so far in my opinion it's going to be hard to top this one this the storyline was perfect. The build up to it was perfect. The performances were perfect. The tension was perfect. The 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 oh, the edge of your seats moments were perfect. Like God, and just to have the ending that they had, just the the last f three or four or five minutes, however long it was, starting with Solo taking himself out of the match by trying to splash on Jimmy through the announcer's table. Jimmy rolling off and Solo just taking the bump completely and going through the table <sighs> to Jay and Jimmy having their their final moments just laying out Roman and Jay climbing up on the top rope while Jimmy sat on the turnbuckles sat, sat on the mat against the turnbuckles and watched Jay do his splash onto Roman for the pin like I, I, I've said it a lot of times already but I really can't stress enough this is what it should be this is the writing that is perfect this is the writing that really makes this stuff worth watching and you can't have it every time otherwise you know it's like a roller coaster that's nothing but but going downhill nothing but loops you know nothing but you know it's an action movie with nothing but explosions it's going to get old eventually so you have to be careful with how you do matches like this and this is how you do it this is just a master class of of wrestling this this is it this is this is this is how you do it so i i can't really say much more without just repeating myself match of the night match of the year for me so far so yeah that was the main event roman lost roman ate the pin mm, just perfection i love it so next we have SummerSlam. it's going to be 
five weeks from now, uh, August 5th. Looking forward to it. What I want. I don't think this is what's going to happen. I think they're probably going to keep the belt on Roman until Mania. I don't like that because that's, what, like nine months away still? So I, I feel like nine more months of this is just insane. What I personally would like, and I'm not a writer for WWE... I'm not saying that this is what it should be. This is just my in a perfect world thing. Is I want Jey Uso versus Roman Reigns main event SummerSlam for the undisputed championship. Jey takes the belts. Jey wins the match. Roman gets pinned, and then Jey says, "The bloodline has had these belts for too long. It's been a major corrupting force. You know, just something, something like some good baby face speech about how." It's about more than just the belts. It's about what this meant for the family as a whole. And because of that, he relinquishes the belts. And the belts can now be part of something different. Part of a new storyline. We can have new characters come in. Be it Cody Rhodes finishing the story, blah, blah, blah. Or, you know, whatever. We finally can move on from the Bloodline storyline. And we can finally focus on something new. And it ends with Jey Uso with an exclamation mark on Roman Reigns and him basically being the super altruist and dropping the belts immediately because it's more important than just some gold around your waist. That's how I would love for it to end at SummerSlam. I don't think that's how it's going to go. I, I do not believe for a second that's how it would go. That's just my personal, this would be amazing. And, you know, a lot of people might disagree with that. That's fine. Like I said, I don't believe this is how it's going to be. That's just my personal take on what I would love to see. But I do think we are going to get a Jimmy versus Roman. I'm sorry. We're going to get a Jay versus Roman at SummerSlam. I do think that that is a given. I think that is an absolute given. So that's what I'm looking forward to. As I said at the start, SummerSlam historically has been one of my favorite pay-per-views ever since I was a little kid. So I'm really, really looking forward to SummerSlam. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I really like what they're dealing with the storyline so far. I think they've they've really set up a lot of greatness this year. Now it's up to them to execute on it. So, yeah, that was Money in the Bank 2023. Really great pay-per-view overall. I loved it. I thought it was a lot of fun. Um, I would say that there were two matches that were kind of duds with the Intercontinental and the Cody Rhodes versus uh, Dominic Mysterio. The Intercontinental one I can kind of forgive because of the Drew McIntyre thing at the end. Um, but those matches weren't for me personally. That's totally fine. That's absolutely okay. I think the pay-per-view more than stood on its own without them. The women's tag team match, I felt like wasn't the best, but it was good for what it was. It did enough. That's fine. The rest of the matches besides those three were anywhere between very good and incredible. So overall, really good pay-per-view. My favorite one of the year so far. And yeah, I look forward to SummerSlam. So thank you for listening. This has been Dusty once again for the Sad Boys Ringside. And I will see you guys next time.